بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين Let me mention this example that many may have heard, may hear it right now for the first time. And there's tens more. But let me talk about this one. May it be something new and some nice lessons out of it. Visualize the scene and circumstances with me. This is 10 years after receiving the revelation of Allah in Mecca. He still didn't go to Medina. He's still in Mecca. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just lost his internal support, his wife Khadija. The woman who took him in when everyone ousted him, as he himself said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the woman who believed in him, when everyone disbelieved in him, the woman who trusted him, when everyone called him a liar. This is what he said about her, his internal support. She's gone now. He lost his external support right after, right about at the same time. He said about his uncle, مَا نَالَتْ قُرَيْشٌ مِنِّي شَيْئًا أَكْرَهُ حَتَّى مَاتَ أَبُو طَالِبُ The man, he said, Quraysh, about his uncle, Quraysh never touched me with harm until my uncle Abu Talib died. These were the darkest days in the da'wah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The word gets to the Quraysians that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam plans to leave Mecca. They begin to say, no way, we're not going to let this happen. The harm and torture on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam reached its peak. The word gets to Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab, pay attention. This is in the first volume of the Tabaqat al-Kubra al-Ibn Sa'id and the first volume on page 211. Pay attention, and I didn't get it wrong. It's Abu Lahab, the most notorious man who's been for 10 years harming the Prophet Muhammad the one who started with a spit at the Prophet If you were to say who's the most notorious man who harmed the Prophet it would be either a competition between Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab. Possibly more likely Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab, because he had his wife and he had his whole family harming the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Lahab was suddenly moved by the zeal of tribalism and jahiliyyah to defend the Prophet Muhammad He's seen all the harm his nephew endured after the death of his brother Abu Talib. He shouted, he said, my nephew will go where he wills and whoever goes near to him, I will chop his neck with my sword. You know, this is Abu Lahab talking. Abu Lahab. The surface shallow layman explanation would be zeal of tribalism. That's what moved him. The real reason for me and you is Allah. Allah. Allah used an unbeliever, an enemy of Islam like Abu Lahab as means to protect the message of Allah. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. It's the power of Allah. The language of the heavens is different. When you put your faith in Allah, doing what He said, the means come to you in ways you never imagined. When, when they thought the elephants, uh, the size of the elephants were so big and so powerful that it can destroy anything in its sight and it did destroy anything until it reached the Kaaba, Allah sent what to those Huge elephants they thought can destroy anything. Little tiny stones, little baby stones. When an namrud thought he can claim lordship to Ibrahim, Allah sent a fly in his brain to put him, put him to his demise. When Aad thought they were strongest, telling Hud, who's more powerful than us? Bring your Lord. Your Lord powerful than us? Bring him on. Man ashaddu minna quwa. Awalam yaraw anna Allah alladhi khalaqa wa ashaddu minna quwa. Allah sent him wind. When Thamud thought they were strong and mighty, it was just a shout, a little cry to destroy them. When the coalition thought they can destroy Islam and the whole world united against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah dispersed them running away with a little bit of a wind. It is Allah. That's Allah. That's the work of Allah. Sun Allah alladhi atqana kulla shay. Allah ends the stories of evil with the smallest means. Take this rule from me. Take this rule from me. Don't occupy yourself ever with how evil ends. Don't occupy yourself ever with how evil ends. Occupy yourself with 
defending and implementing the truth. Abu Lahab, if he is mentioned, and a master in hatred of the Prophet ﷺ is imprinted and embedded in your mind. But for a period of time, Allah, Allah made out of him a protector to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Who made, who made, help me out here, who made out of one of the top notorious enemies of Islam, a man to defend the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for a period of time. Allah, you stand your ground, especially in matters of principles, have yaqeen and watch what Allah is going to do. Allah. Allah will make a way out. Allah, Allah will make a way out where there seems to be no way out. That is Allah. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way out for you. The, the one who has control over minds more than I control my mind can bring victory and power. He controls minds more than one controls his own mind. It is Allah, the one who can come between a person in his mind. Do you understand the Quran? Abu Lahab, tabbat yada Abi Lahab in Watab, who said, Don't believe him, he's a liar. The man who led a media campaign against the Prophet Muhammad, harming the Prophet. Suddenly he says, لِيَخْرُجَ بْنُ أَخِي لِمَا يُرِيدُ وَمَنِ اقْتَرَبَ مِنْهُ بِسُوءٍ دَقَقْتُ عُنُقَهُ بِسَيْفِ Something that doesn't enter your mind. I can understand when Abu Talib was defending the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Talib was alive, he defended the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Talib never became a believer. He played a real, but he never at the same time played a, real, a, a role in harming the Prophet ﷺ. His image was that of a wise man, a calm man who didn't believe, but he defended. Here you have the notorious uncle who harmed him for 10 years, so suddenly defended him. The one we say Allah Akbar, Akbar wanted it and it happened. He's Akbar. Do you really believe he's Akbar? Ya Muhammad. He told Muhammad وسلم, Go about in your business. Do exactly what you were doing while my brother Abu Talib was alive. Go ahead, spread your message. By the Latin, the Uzza, no one will touch you until I die. The Prophet وسلم, went out in da'wah for a time period. Protected by the most notorious enemy of his. Allah. Sunnah Allah. The work of Allah. It is Allah who extracts protection from the head of the kufr to the head of Islam. Allah. That's Allah. Ibn al-Ghaytila cursed the Prophet one time after Abu Lahab said this or right before. Do you know who attacked him and physically beat him? No other than Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab heard he cursed the Prophet, he ran to him and beat him. The troublemakers now, the people of Fitan, the instigators, go to Abu Lahab. Uqba ibn Abi Ma'yat and Abu Jahal, Uqba and Abu Jahal, they went, they heard what Abu Lahab is doing. They said, are you defending, this defendant of the Prophet, is it stemming from your belief in him? Did you believe in him? Asabata? Or is it kinship? He said kinship. They breathed a sigh of relief. At least it's not as bad as they thought it was. At least he's still, he's still on our religion. Then they took it a step further. They used Abu Lahab's jahiliya kinship, zeal, for defending the Prophet ﷺ against him. They said, go ask Muhammad where your father is. Is he in heaven or in hell? Meaning, you defended him, Abu Lahab, you're defending him because he's your nephew. Okay, just go ask him where his dad is. Our father, our leader. Where is he? Muhammad's grandfather, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Where is he? The, the one, he gave birth to you. He's your father. Where is he? In heaven or hell? Go ask your nephew. They told Abu Lahab, go ask your nephew where your father is. Abu Lahab went to the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Said, come here, Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Where's my father? These are lessons to take heed from. Pay attention to the circumstances. He was his, in, just right there, he lost his internal support, it's gone. His external support is gone. 
he's a man alone. One man alone. A ummah in himself. The Prophet ﷺ is weak and lonely. One of the weakest points of da'wah. Ghuraba, no one knows that but a true da'iyah who faces the circumstances which you feel and go through. He was so weak and lonely that Allah revealed to him Surah Yusuf to make him feel better. And then took him to the heavens in Isra, right at that time. Because it was one of the weakest points of the Prophet ﷺ. Everyone was against him. Today, today, the diluted, watered down, wishy-washy Muslims would have said, come on, come on Muhammad Wasallam, tell him his father's in Jannah, let's, let's get it over with, just win him over. Tell him his father's in Jannah. The Nambi Pambi of today would have told the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, we need the superpower of Abu Lahab to protect us. Don't be a radical. Come on, come on, just clip your wala and bara a little bit and, and tell him what he wants to hear so he won't harm us. The spineless, the gutless of today would have cried wisdom, 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 go gradual on the kid. They would have said, go gradual on Abu Lahab. Go. The, 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 the topsy-turvy who suckle their version of Islam from the intelligence of the West instead of from deriving it from the Quran and Sunnah would have the, told the Prophet Wasallam, you're weak Muhammad Wasallam, you're weak. This is a small window of da'wah opportunity. Aha, interfaith. Yeah, yeah, interfaith. Tell him, you know, make it broad. Make it seem like it's broad. All the Abrahamic religions, well, they're all going to heaven. They're all going to be in Jannah. All of them, all of them. They, they, tell him what he wants to hear. Then after he becomes Muslim, we'll sit him down. You leave that to us. We'll sit him down and teach him that his father is really in hell. Tell him his father is in, in Jannah. Because he's now protecting you. You owe him some favors. He will, he will kill and torture you and us. That's what the deviant people of today would have said. But full of confidence, full of yaqeen in Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, your father is with his people. Ma'aqawbih. He went, Abu Lahab walked away. He went told Uqba and Abu Jahl. Muhammad ﷺ just said, my father is with my people. Uqba and Abu Jahl knew what the Prophet meant. That he's in hell. They knew exactly what the Prophet ﷺ meant. And they were right. They knew and they were sure about it. They told Abu Lahab, go ask him what he meant when he said, Ma'aqawmi, he's with his people. Let him make it clear to you. What did he mean? They know Abu Lahab did it. Abu Lahab returns. Imagine the pressure that would be on a man in a predicament that the Prophet ﷺ is in. That's why I mentioned to you the circumstances around the story. On one hand, you have the biggest leaders, the biggest leader of his time, an ex-enemy defending him heart and soul, and you owe him favors for defending you. On the other hand, it's the laws and rules of Allah, the Sharia of Allah. The Prophet had the opportunity, and it's going to cause him harm. The Prophet ﷺ had the opportunity to sugarcoat it. He could have sugarcoated it. His answer, when Abu Lahab returned, he said, Muhammad, Muhammad, did you mean my father, sallallahu alayhi wa did you mean my father is in hell? The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Naam. Yes, that's exactly what I meant. That's exactly what I meant. Not, not only that, him and who died on what he died, that is in hell. Allah. Allah, it don't matter who is in before you. Allah is going to protect you. Allah khayrun hafidah. Abu Lahab on the spot said, I'm your enemy forever and began to harm the Prophet ﷺ and encourage others to harm him and torture him. La barihtu. La barihtu laka aduwan wa anta taz'umu anna abda al-muttalib fi nar Fashtadda alayhi huwa wasair Quraysh. He flipped on the Prophet ﷺ and he encouraged others to flip on him and harm him more. The Prophet could have avoided that with one word. He could have sugarcoated it. Are you telling me the Prophet ﷺ had no wisdom? Are you trying to tell me he threw himself and the few believers into danger? At one of the darkest moments of the Prophet ﷺ's da'wah life, why didn't the Prophet ﷺ give him a word to please him to overcome that dark era? Why didn't the Prophet ﷺ say, he is with his people and keep it at that. Or Allah knows best. We got fundamental principles there is no compromise on no matter what. 
no matter what the consequences are. Some teachings, we don't accept graduality in them. You have to see them how they are. You have to see them how they are. You got to implement them how they are. Why didn't the Prophet Sallallahu say, Look, Abu Lahab, give me a few days, gather a few believers around, and vote on it. Let's vote on it. What is Abu, Abu Abdul Muttalib in Jannah or Jahannam? Gather a few of the Sahaba there and vote on it. Let's vote on it. You don't play games like that with the laws of Allah. It's not a game to be played with. I don't care what alam gave a fatwa on that. That's the laws of Allah. You don't vote. Who are you to vote on it and accept that? Do you think the Prophet Sallallahu didn't know he was weak? Do you think the Prophet ﷺ didn't know what the consequence of telling him his dad is in hell would be? Do you think he didn't know all that? But there's no compromise on principles. I'm sorry to tell you that. That's the religion of Allah. Telling him his father is in hell is a principle. Ahmed, are you in your right mind? Yes, that's a principle. How? That's one of the reasons I tell you that inner faith is a religion of kufr. It's not Islam. It's the religion of kufr. Non-believers even under Muslim rule, have a right to remain on their false belief. We have to know it's false. We spoke on that. And Islam will not compel. La ikraha fi deen. They are ahl al-dhimmah. Ahl under Muslim rule, they are protected. And they have rights. Even as far as rights as we give them welfare to survive. Part of our belief is anyone who got the message and dies a non-believer, He's in hell. It's a principle. No sugar coat in it. When the Prophet tells him his father is going to Jannah, that means, number one, that the Prophet ﷺ is going against clear verses in a hadith that he spoke about. Principles. That's what the wicked people of interfaith do today. That's why one of the many reasons that it's a kufr religion, the interfaith. When the Prophet tells him that his father who died, non-believer, is in heaven, that means Abdul Muttalib is right. Because that means he's going to heaven. Only right people go to heaven. That entails those who follow Abdul Muttalib are on the right path as well. They're all in Jannah. Because they followed him, he's in Jannah. They followed him, he's in Jannah. Who are the opponents in belief to Abdul Muttalib? The Prophet ﷺ and his followers. Those who oppose the people of Jannah, had the Prophet told them he's in Jannah, are where? That means the Prophet and his people are in hell. That's why it's a principle. If he would have told him, your father is in Jannah, he's going against the clear verses and laws of Allah. That means those who oppose the people of Jannah, like Abdul Muttalib and Abu Lahab, are evil. And that's the Prophet ﷺ and his people. That's why he told him, your father is in hell. It's a principle. It's the same principle that Allah's laws must govern our lands. It's a principle. Same principle, same type of principle. The problem we have is that hearts are detached. They're detached from Allah. We talk a lot about yaqeen and belief in Allah, but they're detached from Allah. That's the reality of our ummah. And they're attached to earthly means and everything but Allah. That's a reality. Let's not fool ourselves. Hearts attached to humans in times of hardship, distance the victory and help of Allah. Iran and those who hate Aisha in the West are not and could not and would not help you. Even, 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 even the wishy-washy version of Islam, they wouldn't like and help. And, care, and, and, and you've seen what happened. You compromise on the principles of deen and attach your heart to vanishing means, but then expect the victory from Rabbil Alameen. Malakum kayfa tahkumun. Malakum kayfa tahkumun. What kind of thinking is that? Help me out. What kind of thinking is that? Once we hold ourselves accountable, do what Allah ordered us to do, how He ordered us, then we shall have full yaqeen as we're doing that, his support and victory and help will come hailing on us. The Prophet wasallam in every dark time had was the most optimistic and most helpful. Every situation he endured that was difficult, he was the most optimistic in it. 
He had the, that's true yaqeen in Allah. In every dark time the Prophet ﷺ went through, his eyesight penetrated through the darkness to see the light at the end of the tunnel that no one else seen. You can't name me a single hardship the Prophet ﷺ went through, except that I'll tell you how the Prophet ﷺ was most optimistic. That's yaqeen. That's yaqeen. When he did what Allah told him to do, he had yaqeen. When the world was against him in Al-Ahzab, the confederation, he's digging a trench. They're terrorized in fear. And he says, rest assured, the two superpowers in the middle of the globe, they're going to be under our rule. What? What? The hypocrite said, what is this man saying? We can't go to the side over there and urinate out of fear of the enemy. We'll burden a trench to defend ourselves. And you tell us we're going to rule the world? But the believers, that boosted their iman. Every hardship they seen, it boost, that's yaqeen. Within less than two decades, his prophecy became true, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, seen relief and victory and hope in the womb of every obstacle in distress that he and his Sahaba endured, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. While pelted with stones, and Zayd was next to him, his servant is next to him, he's hurt, he's pelted, and your beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every time they pelt him and he falls down, they lift him up and pelt him more with stones. He's bleeding, he's suffering, he's in agony, he looks at Zayd, what do you think he tells Zayd? لا تعجل إن الله جاعل لما ترى فرجا ومخرجا. Don't rush it, Zayd. Don't rush it, Zayd. What, 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 Allah is going to find relief and victory out for us. Who's bringing the victory? إن الله إن الله الله. He said Allah. Who did he say? Iran. إن الله إن الله نا أبو لهب. Did he say, maybe I can go back right now and mend relations with Abu Lahab. Maybe, maybe, you know, he'll accept me once again. I may, must have made a mistake when I told him off and told him his father's in hell. Maybe I'll go to the Romans, they'll support me. Let me throw myself at the hands of the Persians. That's not Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's not Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inna Allah, Inna Allah. What an ummah today. Allah told us how to who to and how to attach ourselves for victory and we honor and clinch on everything but those and means that Allah told us to. We attach ourselves to his enemies and seek honor in them but then think the victory of Allah is going to descend upon us? They attempt, that's why we got to ask why. That's why we have to ask why. They attempted to see power and status with those who curse Aisha and seek honor from other enemies of Allah and His Messenger? Since when do the enemies of Islam give victory to Islam? Are you trying to make the impossible possible? Listen, to with, listen with me to the lantern of the prophecy of the Prophet of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لا تعجل إن الله جاعل لما ترى فرجا ومخرجا he have hope in Allah in difficult times. Have hope in Allah, yaqeen in Allah. In Allah nasir wa The Prophet is talking about what's going to happen when he's being pelted with stones. He's being pelted and ousted. He has nowhere to go, no safe haven, nowhere to go. And he tells his only friend, his servant. He says, Allah will make victory to his messenger and will make this religion supreme. The stones are falling on his head and he's saying that. Look at the verse of Allah. We read the Quran, do we really believe it? That's the problem we have. They want to extinguish Allah's light, but Allah refuses except that his light should be perfected even though they hate it. Listen to the next verse. هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون. He sent his messenger with the guidance 
with the Quran, with the laws of Allah, with the truth, with Islam, to make it superior over, this is a promise from Allah for all times, to make it superior over all religions, even if they refuse. Even if they refuse. Even if they refuse because it's a promise from Allah. وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ This verse is in Surah At-Tawbah. You know when it was revealed? I mentioned there's a similar verse in another surah, but this one is in Surah At-Tawbah. Stating that Allah shall be, that the religion of Allah shall be superior. This verse was revealed nine years after the Hijrah. Meaning right a little bit, a few years before the Prophet ﷺ died. After he became victorious. And he was well established in Medina. But the words he told Zayd earlier, promising him and assuring him victory, he told it on his hardest, most difficult day that he later on told Aisha that was my most difficult day. He said it, the promise of victory, he said it on the most difficult day of his da'wah career when he was rejected from a ta'if. He said it 10 years after revelation in Mecca, 10 years after revelation, not after Hijrah, three years before going to Medina approximately. Note, 10 years after revelation, he said the promise to Zay. Three years before heading to Medina, before even establishing his Islamic state. Yaqeen, faith in Allah. From the time he assured Zayd that they will be supreme and superior and victorious to the actual time when they became superior and supreme and victorious, the time when this verse was revealed in Surah Tawbah, there was 12 years in between. 12 years in between. He was firm on his principle that he had and he had certainty and yaqeen in Allah. 12 years before the verse was revealed, he held his solid ground in the most difficult times. He had full yaqeen and remained steadfast. The lesson is you remain on your principles no matter what and have yaqeen, the victories there. Allah promised that Islam will be victorious. Wallahi, it's going to be victorious. You don't doubt me, you doubt in Allah if you say otherwise. If Islam becomes victorious, with you, you succeeded. It's your win. If Islam becomes victorious and you gave da'wah, you become, it's your win. If it becomes victorious without you, it's your loss. With you or without you, the result's the same. Islam will be victorious. That's, take these as rules. If not you and me, Wallah al azim is going to be those kids and like those kids in Syria who are memorizing the Quran and al usul al thalafa Them or their likes. That's it. Wa in tatawallaw, yastabdil qawman ghayrakum, thumma la yakulu amthalakum. He was optimistic. He was optimistic in the darkest times that he endured, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's what I want you to see when you see the massacres of Al Ghuta, the masjid where they massacred people in it, the massacre of Rabi'ah, have yaqeen. If you hold your ground on the tawheed of Allah and on the principle, our call is a call of sharia, not shari'ah. Our call is sharia, not shari'ah. Suraqa found the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's hideout when he was fleeing from Mecca in another one of his most darkest times. He's fleeing, he's ousted. Suraqa finds the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the Lord of Suraqa saves the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 200 camels on the head of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Get him dead or alive, him and his friend with him. Suraqa. Suraqa is fully armed. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walking with the shirt on his back, no weapons. Abu Bakr keeps looking back. He's worried. The Prophet is firm. In yaqeen. He did what Allah told him. Go, do this, do He did it. And he had full yaqeen in Allah. He protected Allah. Allah will protect him. What do you think the verses mean when we recite? If you give victory to Allah, Allah will give you victory. In the hadith of Ibn Abbas, we, we all know this stuff. But we don't understand it and we don't fully comprehend it and believe it. Does Allah want us to take weapons and go defend Him? Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Take weapons and defend one who's on top of seven heavens on His throne. Is that what's meant? In tansurullah yansurkum? Ihfadillah yahfadah? 
The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam points to Suraq as camel and it sinks. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُو He says, make dua for me and I'll leave you. So the Prophet makes dua and he's able to get out. But as soon as he surfaces out, the world comes back to Suraqa and he make, tries another attempt against the Prophet ﷺ to either kill or imprison him. He sinks again. The third time, the Prophet ﷺ tells him, tells him, go back Suraqa after he made dua the second time. The third time he says, go back Suraqa and you'll get the bracelets of Kisra. Yaqeen! Go, go back. Listen to this. Listen to an ousted fugitive with the shirt on his back, him and Abu Bakr. The world is against him. 200 camels bounty on his head and his friend's head. In the deep desert. He doesn't know if he's going to make it a few feet or not. And you tell me, you're going to give me the bracelets of the man who leads the superpower of the time. When he said, I'll give you the bracelets, it was yaqeen in Allah. Basically, let me rephrase what the Prophet ﷺ meant when he told Suraqa that you'll get the bracelets of Kisra. Here's what he meant with that little word that he said. He said, he's telling Suraqa, I'm going to Medina, Suraqa, and I'm going to establish Khilafah in Medina, and I'm going to, Islam is going to be honored, and Islam is going to sp spread, and it's going to flourish and nourish, and we're going to take over the power of Kisra, the empire of Kisra. That's what he meant when he said you'll get the bracelets of Kisra. There was two superpowers back then. And it was a competition. One time the Romans would win and one time the Persians would win. It would be one time the Persians and one time the Romans. The competition between was those two. Kisra was the leader of the Persian. Because at that time when the Prophet ﷺ said that to Suraqa, the Persian Empire was the top, was number one. These bracelets were not, you know, they, 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 they were back then more famous than the, the crown jewels of our day today. These were bracelets that symbolized power. Meaning, we're going to get his power. For those who don't know, these bracelets were not a bracelet like this watch that you put on your hand. Or you know how women put bracelets on their hands. These bracelets were so heavy that they didn't wear them. They were too heavy to wear. They would simply put their hands on a hand rest and put their hands in them because they're too heavy. They're too heavy. They're just a show of power. It's deep when he told them, I'm going to give you the bracelet of Kisra when he's ousted in the deep desert? When did he say that? In the desert, a fugitive wanted, the Qurayshans are after him, each one in to take a part of him. He didn't even leave the desert of Mecca yet. He didn't even start on his journey yet. And he's promising Suraqa, the bracelets. He did all he did. He did all he had to do. He did all he was ordered to do. Then he had full yaqeen in Allah. The Ummah today has a deficiency in both yaqeen and accepting and submission to Allah's laws and principles. After 10 years, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dies. Then a couple more years, Abu Bakr takes Khilafah and he dies. Then Umar, in less than two decades, reaps the seeds that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam planted for him. Umar goes, he gets the bracelets of Kisra, you know the story. Then he shouts, where's Suraqa? The first thing he does, where's Suraqa? If the world forgot, Umar would never forget the promise that his teacher made to Suraqa. Radiallahu an. Suraqa, come here Suraqa. Aina Suraqa. Here's the bracelets the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam promised you in the desert. The point we need to have yaqeen and faith in Allah during these difficult times, these desperate times that this ummah goes to. He was ousted when he made the promise sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everything was going against him. But there was full yaqeen in Allah. And it happened as he said in Surah Al-Ahzab. Pay attention. Surah Al-Ahzab. Surah Al-Ahzab is confederation, coalition. It's named after the coalition that attempted to attack the Prophet ﷺ. In it, 
لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر Indeed in the messenger of Allah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم You have a good example You have a good example to follow For those who have hope in Allah in the last day لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر What surah you follow the footsteps of the Prophet What surah is that in? In surah Al-Ahzab Let's draw a connection why is it in Surah Al-Ahzab? The confederation, the coalition, when every tribe sent supporters to go take the Prophet ﷺ to extinction. That was the aim of it. It's as if he's saying, when the world is against you, when everything's going against you, and you see no way out of it, follow, you must follow in the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ. In what surah is it again? In Surah Al-Ahzab. When the world's against you, you have an example to follow. And in Surah Al-Ahzab, again, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَ إِذَا قَضَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ عَمْرِيمٍ It's not for a believer, man or woman. When Allah and His Messenger give Allah, when his, Allah and His Messenger give a decree, that they should give any input or option or decision in what Allah and His Messenger gave Allah in, in an order in. Why in Al-Ahzab, again? The sort of coalition, confederation. In simple layman terms, when the world comes after you, and they have, stick to your tawheed, your principles, firm on the belief of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the outcome of what happened to the Prophet sallallahu will happen to you. It's deep. When you do that which Allah ordered you to do, have full yaqeen in Allah, that everything's gonna be okay. How? We read the Quran, but do we really, do we really understand it? And that's our problem, and that's our point. Speed reading during Ramadan, which you know, we mentioned it, some ulama said speed reading is good in Ramadan because the time is extra credit time and you want to get more reading in it. It's good to speed read. Now, slow down the speed reading and learn and comprehend and contemplate what you see and read in the Quran. Allah told Nuh. Build a ship, Noah. Did he vote on it? Did he object to it? If you look at everything, everything, all the odds were against Noah. But no. Build a ship means build a ship. Build a ship means build a ship. Allah said it. Did he say, they're going to cut my grants? They're not going to let me access the trees down there that I got to chop down? Build a ship means build a ship. It's a command from Allah. It's not me and you talking to each other. It's a command from Allah. He chopped down the logs and took a hammer, began to build a ship. His people seeing him, they said, what's up with that Noah? What's going on here Noah? He said, this is the house that floats on water. They began to laugh. They thought it was funny. They mocked him. They said, Noah, oh now after being a prophet of Allah, now so suddenly you're a carpenter? You Noah, alone, are going to build that ship three levels? Yeah, right. Three levels and take all the believers and the animals and put them on that ship and just go float away on that supposedly house of water. He was constructing the ship. Whenever his people passed by, they would mock him. What did he tell him? قَالَ إِن تَسْخَرُوا مِنَّا فَإِنَّا نَسْخَرُوا مِنْكُمْ كَمَا تَسْخَرُونَ If you mock us, you mock us because they thought it was just him building the logs, chopping the logs and putting the wood together. They don't know there was a power behind him. You mock us, it's going to come a time when I'm gonna, we're going to mock you. Notice, he did what Allah told him even though it seemed impossible. They mocked him. They hurt him. Then he made dua. Rabbi inni maghlubun fantasar. He made dua. When he was chopping the log and hammering it with his hammer and constructing the ship in obedience to Allah, and then he said, Inni maghlubun fantasar. Do you think that he thought that Allah was going to drown the universe for him? Allah was behind him. Do you think he thought that though? The mother of Musa, 
She had plenty to object about, plenty to complain. And the sisters know that all very well. وَأُوحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِيهِ فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِ وَلَا تَحْزَنِي The mother of Musa, put your son in the water. Put your son in the water. Baby infant. Moms, the moms, the sisters know this well. Put them in a basket. Make a little casket in a basket and toss him in the Nile. She, she nurses him. She puts him in a basket. This is the time to object. She puts him in the Nile and throws him and tosses him out. Who throws a son in the water? Especially the strong currents in this deep water of the Nile. Do you know that, that, that subhanAllah, the Nile River, many say it's about 4,132 oh, 4, miles long. It's, it's said to be one of the longest, possibly the longest river in the world. Assigned to us. He says, put it in the water. She put it in the water. Not why, but and I got to go vote on it. Her infant's in the casket. She doesn't hesitate to carry the command of Allah. The laws of Allah. Allah said, do it. She did it. That's it. Doesn't make sense to me and you. And probably her. But Allah said it. That's it. Oh, Musa said, Allah told me, I'm going to do it. Allah told us to establish our tawheed on this earth. We're supposed to say, we obey, we hear, and we shut our mouths after that. Fantasy. And it doesn't work. And vote. And all that. Then we're in the predicament we're in. When she puts Musa in the Nile, she didn't know that later on. She didn't know that later on. Just like Nuh didn't know that Allah's going to join his own, his own world. She didn't know that in the palace of Fir'aun, Musa's going to scream. Asya, the wife of Fir'aun, is going to tend to him, but he's not going to be quiet. The guards are going to come help her tend to him, but he's not going to be quiet. The nurses are in lines trying to calm him down, and he's not going to cry, stop. His cry is louder and louder. It was the mercy of Allah, the most merciful, the gentleness of the most gentle of Allah that made out of the screams of Musa means to bring the mother of Musa back to unite with her son. It is Allah. It is Allah. 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 If she did what she was told and she did, she gets what she was promised. And in between those, and in between those, she has full yaqeen in Allah that Allah will full his, fulfill His promise. Let me repeat. Let me repeat these laws. Let me repeat these rules. These are from the Quran. If she did what she was told and she did, she gets what she was promised. And in between those, she has full yaqeen in Allah that she, he will fulfill his promise to her. What's the promise? Inna radduhu ilayki wa ja'iluhu minal mursaleen. We shall bring him. Um Musa, do what you're told. We shall bring him back to you. And we shall make him one of our messengers. The same applies to me and you, Ummat Muhammad. When you become inheritors and rulers of the lands, the pure lands, the pure lands that oh, 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 uh, Amr ibn al-As opened, establish the laws of Amr ibn al-As on him. That's what it means. The same applies. In Tansurullah, Yansurkum. Just like Um Musa was promised, we were promised. She fulfilled, we didn't. In Al-Fatih al-Rabbani, al-Shawkani, and I always wonder what the circumstances behind him saying this is. In Fath al-Rabbani, the eighth volume, he said, We tried limitless ways of our laws and methods of life. The benefit, all the benefit, the righteousness, all the righteousness, the wisdom, all the wisdom. Wisdom in this world and in the hereafter is in the pure sharia of Allah. That's, that's what we should put between our eyes when we, we think. When Ibrahim left Hajar, in a land with no water, no crop, no human. Allahu amaraka bihada. Allah told you to do this? He said, yes. She said, go, go, go. Allah will not neglect us. If He told you to do this, go. Did He even, or she, in their wildest imagination, upon complying, while they were complying, with the difficult task, of leaving a woman deserted with nowhere 
think that a spring would break out of the earth, Zamzam, from that day, and it will continue until the judgment day? When Musa left with Ben Israel in submission to Allah's command, Fir'aun behind him, the waters in front of him. Allah said, go, he goes. The waters in front of him. The Fir'aun's behind him. Full yaqeen in Allah. He did what Allah told him. Did he ever imagine that it will part and each part would be like a mountain? What happens? Ibrahim puts his son, his child, his son that he so long awaited for his birth. He takes him and he takes the knife. The law of Allah, the rule of Allah. Allah told him to do it, he's going to do it. And his son is looking at him, telling him, if ma tu'mar, do it, do it. When dad and son were talking and having that conversation in submission to Allah, do it, and I'm going to do it. Did any of them think a ram nurtured in Jannah for 500 years was being prepared for a moment like that? Yaqeen, confidence in Allah. Use the means you have. Like Hajar in the many examples that I said. Use the means you have like Hajar in the desert. Depend on Allah like Ibrahim. Make dua like Nuh. Submit like Um Musa. In all those situations, they acted in matters anyone of the deluded people of today would have said, don't do it. You're crazy if you do it. They did it. And in all the situations, the ease in victory, comes from ways no one, not even they, would have perceived it. When Yusuf, when Yusuf was in prison and he had full yaqeen and tawakkul on Allah, did an earthquake break him out of prison? Did an earthquake dismantle the doors of the prison or blow the prison walls out so he could walk out? You know how it was? With yaqeen in Allah? In the deep darkness of the night, Allah sent a dream that infiltrated the king's brains and the dream by as, as a means from Allah is what got him out of prison. He made a dream seep into the leader's brains that was the means of release that Allah chose for him. It is Allah. Certainty in Allah overtopples despair and takes you out of the misery or the bad situation you're in. Certainty in Allah, yaqeen in Allah. Certainty, yaqeen in Allah has unfortunately become words mentioned on our pulpits and on our tongues. Words that are not fully embedded in our hearts nor established in our lives. Let me conclude. I know I stay too long, but let me conclude with this story. Hulako, we mentioned a lot about Hulako, remember in Ramadan. Those who were present in the Ramadan gyms, I mentioned who Hulaku was, the leader, one of the leaders of the Mongols. He massacred the Muslims. He had a daughter that was walking around in town one time. She seen a man and he had a crowd around him. She asked, who's that guy? They told her, that's a sheikh, that's a alim. That's one of their alim. They run the Muslim land. There's a sheikh there. They were probably asking him questions. She said, oh, that's, she, that's a sheikh? She tried to embarrass him. But look. A lot of lessons in the story, I don't want to get into it, but you'll understand it because we don't have time. Hulaku's daughter told the sheikh or alim, are you guys not the people that say, Allah will make you guys victorious and supreme and inheritors on the sand? Don't you guys say that? It's in your Quran. That's fake because you're under our rule. I can order any one of my guards to kill you right now and you guys are under my rule. He said, do you know, the sheikh said, do you know shepherds? They take a few dogs when they take their sheep to graze. This is common, even in today. You can, you can you see shepherds, they take a couple dogs. He asked her, what's the purpose of those dogs when the shepherd? Everyone knows the purpose. She said, when the sheep run out of the herd, the dogs are unleashed and run wild after the sheep to get them back in the herd. He told her, Hulaku's daughter, you guys are the dogs. Allah unleashed you after us to get us back in the guidance of the Quran and the Sunnah. 
Once we get back in the guidance of the Quran and the Sunnah, you will be tethered by the one who unleashed you. Deep story. Meaning when we come back to Allah, that's when we'll become victorious over you. أَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ أَنْ يُنْصُرَ دِينَ وَيَعْلِ كَلِمَاتَ وَيُخْذِ الْأَعْذَاءَ وَأَنْ يُبْرُ مَلَ هَذِي الْأُمَّةِ أَمْرَ رُشْدٍ يُعَزُّ فِيهِ أَهْلُ طَاعَاتِ وَيُهْدَى فِيهِ أَهْلُ مَعْصِيَةِ وَيُؤْمَرُ فِيهِ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيُنْهَى فِيهِ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ إِنَّهُ سَمِيعُ الدُّعَاءَ اللَّهُمَّ وَأَظْهِرِ الْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ الَّذِي بَعَثْتَ بِهِ نَبِيَّكَ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ